period, full stop. But a part of the trauma that comes from white supremacy and anti-blackness and religious trauma as it has been imposed upon us by white colonizers is that we don't want to have conversations about queer people in a queer community. Mm. It's not until things happen like what happened to Brother Jesse Small yet, which most of y'all love because of his performances. That, that brother has spent his entire life being disruptive, showing up in spaces, trying to remind us that which I'm talking about now. And he was persecuted for it. And, and too often, if you play back what people have said over the last weeks, if you listen to black radio, they only wanted to talk about the fact that they call him a nigger. Mm -hmm. And then the white folks only want to talk about the fact that they called him a faggot. Mm -hmm. We exist in the world having multiple identities. Some of us experience multiple forms of oppression. To your point, you talked about babies and suicide. LGBTQ youth are most likely to be kicked out of their homes and pushed out of schools. Black babies that have those compounded interests is why there are so many black queer people in prisons now. And so, so much of this work is us doing what Ariana talks about all the time, naming a thing a thing and telling the truth. And so it is my job to be disruptive. I spend most of my time showing up in K-12 spaces and spending time at HBCUs reminding people that we exist and unless and until we lean into these intersections and talk about how it is that we heal and do the work of being anti-racist, anti-homophobic, for black folks practicing trans massage noir, which is how black trans women are uniquely affected by some of these things, that we'll never get free. And this is so important because so many of us and everybody connected to the CARES Network does this work because we believe in shared liberation. But Fannie Lou Hamer said a long time ago that unless, uh, unless and until all of us are free, none of us are free. And now the last point I wanna make now is that if you've never thought about why this is important, leveraging your privilege, for me, this isn't about you having to identify with somebody's identity. I don't need your approval about me or anybody I love. The question for me is if you purport to care about the liberation of black people, it has to be about all black people. And if you don't, I need you to get out of the way. There's too much work to be done. The sad note, stop, I don't need it, I mean this. The sad reality is that black queer people have been at the forefront of these movements. You talked hey, about Patrice. Some of the names. Let's call, let's just say the names. Byron so, Rustin. There would not be a March on Washington if it were not for Byron Rustin. When you hear the words of Langston Hughes, you're it's, hearing the words of a gay man. Uh, uh, James, Baldwin, James Baldwin is still trying to teach us how to love. How to love ourselves, especially as black men. You talk about mental health. Go see if Bill Street could talk. Yes. That is all that this is about. That still exists today. We're talking about the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. White people are all in their feelings talking about they less themselves. That wouldn't happen if it were not for Marsha P. Johnson. Come on. A black, a black trans woman yes. who most black people still can't even name. Or Miss Major. At all. It, so, it, today, you talked about Patrice. The, the first person I know that have used the phrase Black Lives Matter is a black queer professor named Marcus Hunter at UCLA. And then there are three women, two of whom are, are queer, yes. who are responsible for what we know to be the movement. In Ferguson, it was um, more than 80% of the people on the ground in Ferguson were black women, and roughly half were queer, and a good percentage of those people came from another state to stand there, which risked their actual lives. We talked last night together about courage, put their lot bodies on the lives as black <laughs> transgendered women. They do it all the time. Every year, black women, black trans women are disproportionately murdered. And we don't even talk about it. There were five unsolved murders last year of black trans women in Jacksonville, Florida. In January of this year, a black pastor killed a black trans woman in Detroit. The fact that y'all don't know it pisses me off. I mean it. There's a black queer boy who was choked outside a Waffle House for being black and gay in Warsaw, North Carolina. Anthony Wall faces criminal charges to this day. We don't talk about it. Shakisha Clemens experienced the beginning stages of rape on camera at the hands of three white male officers in Waffle House in Sarah Lane, Alabama. We don't talk about it. Kevin Hart makes a joke about killing his black gay son, and people then think that we're sensitive when last year a black man killed his gay son in Las Vegas. There are two black male bodies that have been found in the home of a white man named Ed Buck in Hollywood, California. That man has not even seen the inside of a jail cell. What I'm saying is that we often get outraged at these moments where we miss the fact that this happens to us every single day. And I'm gonna land this plane just to go back to the question is, who's gonna stand for our babies as they work through this? Now more than ever, kids in school identify as queer. And to be clear, there's no gay agenda. They're not saying that they're part of the LGBTQ movement, but what they're saying is that the boxes that have been created and imposed upon them don't fit. Our babies who are most sensitive, who are most thoughtful, who love themselves the most are the first ones to say, this system ain't set up for me. 
Y'all ain't here in my best interest. They're the first ones to get suspended, expelled, told they're not worth being in spaces where there's purpose to be. It is our job to be disruptive, not just for the kids who look like us and affirm our personal experiences. This is what I'm saying. We have to be thoughtful about all of us that show up in this space. Those of us that have disabilities, hidden and invisible. Those of us that have housing insecurities. Those of us who have gone with, with hunger. Those of us who are also LGBTQ and same gender loving. Everybody's deserving of love too. David Johns. So uh, the question was, it appropriate to say queer? I appreciate that from the master teacher, and it is. We should know that the, the, the definition of that which is queer is just the opposite of that which is pejorative. In a country in which white is taught to be supremacist, black is queer. To be clear, the letters that most people use are LGBTQIA+, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, er, period. Come back to that later. Transgender, queer, and questioning. Some people then use I for intersex. Some people use A for asexual. Whole lot of conversation, but that's a lot of white people stuff. I, I complicate that even more because I, my, I'm black first. That's what you see. If I invite you in and let you know who I love, then we can have another conversation. So I use the term same gender loving, created by a black man named Cleo Monago to, to identify that gay is a, is a political construct and it has a whole lot to do with white stuff. But it is always okay to say queer. It is most appropriate to ask someone to not make assumptions based on somebody's presentation. What are your pronouns? What is your name? How would you like for me to refer to? But as long as you do it with care, it's okay. Thank you for the question. May I quickly add Thank a point? Thank I you for, let me just, let me just bring uh, Iyanla into this and have a, um, and then we'll come back around. <laughs> you know, um, all the points that Byron and, and David made remind me of the many harms that have been done to so many of us um, in the name of religion, in the name of I know better than you. Um, they've created these and constructed these walls. They're not easy, Mama Iyanla, to <coughs> undo. And so I wanna talk to you a bit about how we heal and forgive so that we can love Holy, um, you know, forgiveness, which you've written about so beautifully and which I've leaned on, is, um, is a complicated, complicated ask of people. I don't know that I've yet forgiven myself from the last guy I dated, and so I haven't dated anyone since. I don't even know that I could feel my heart to ever get open again. And I was somebody who was, you know, I was always getting married to somebody. <laughs> I was trying. I was trying. But honestly, I really can't imagine being in love again. I really, I can't envision it. Because I know I haven't forgiven myself for the harm that, that happened in my house. And, I, and so that's for me. That's my own personal struggle with forgiveness. But I know there's something at that very idea of what we need to forgive in order to love holy. And I wonder if you could pull that apart for us a bit. Oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, let me thank you. Um, as I was sitting here, two things come to mind for me very strongly. One is, before I shaped you in your mother's womb, I knew yeah. you. And we don't have to be Christian to embrace that. I can give that to you in Yoruba. I can give it to you in out of the Bhagavad Gita. I can give it to you out of Native American tradition. Those words, the concept that we come from a place beyond the beyond that stays with us and never goes away. And that place is the creative, the generating source of all life. Before I shaped you, in your mother's <laughs> womb, I knew you would be black. I knew you would be queer. I knew you would be um, challenged by cancer. I knew you would be bald by the time you were 42. I knew you would date that guy. I knew <laughs> you would date him. <laughs> I knew I you would you be, did. yeah. You know, that place. 
And because that place, that essence, that energy, whether you call it God, Jesus, Lord, Bhagavad Gita, Baha'u'llah, Olodumari, Nyame, whatever you call it, Takashala, Wagandanka, whatever it is that you call it, that place that shaped and molded you before you were in your mother's womb knew you and is still with you. For me, we got to get there. Because that knew that you were going to face trauma and equipped you to deal with it. That knew that you were going to be disruptive and equipped you to, to do it. Knew that you were going to meet him, bring him home, create the drama. Knew that I was going to be raped at nine. She was going to be beat at 13. Knew it, and it's in you, and we know it. So as a metaphysician and a soul surgeon, I want us to get to that place within so that we can understand at a deeper level why, 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 and how. Because some of us just ask why, 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 and we get stuck in the why, and we can't get to the forgiveness. But if we get to the why did I experience this, and how have I grown, healed, learned, strengthened my power, greatness as a result of it, okay, then I can forgive you for showing up looking that way, mm -hmm. but recognize that you facilitated the greatness that needs to come forward in me. It's about universal law and principle. It's about understanding the, understanding the energetics, the harmonics in which we live. <coughs> we do laundry, we do dry cleaning, we do, we'll clean the mop, we'll change the sheets, and we don't clean our energy. And a lot of what we experience in life we can do it psychologically, we can do it emotionally, we can do it spiritually, but we also have to do it energetically. Some of us just look poor because our family been <laughs> poor. Some of us look mean because our mama was mean. Some of us look, you know, <laughs> because that's just energetic. So we got to take this thing to all levels, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. And now in the 21st century, it has to become energetic. If we look at an energetic, we also look at something Dr. Joy was talking about. Some of us marinated in crazy in the womb. <laughs> Just like me. I marinated in crazy in the womb. While I was being shaped and formed, the greatness that was shaping and forming me sent me to that womb to marinate in that crazy so that I would learn what I needed to learn to become who I needed to become to do what I needed to do. But it was still crazy in the womb. And it was drunk crazy. Okay, that's a whole different kind of crazy. So that crazy of guilt and shame that was my crazy you got to figure out what yours was mine was guilt and shame because my mother was the other woman dating a married man and i was a product of an illicit affair so she was sad and lonely that her man was around the corner with his wife on christmas and then guilty and ashamed which led her to drink that's the crazy that i marinated in that's in my bones it was in my hair follicles it was in my lips it was in everything and then I go to school and they say, if you don't do this, we're not going to give you a gold A, you know? And I'm just trying to function every day and be human. What kind of crazy did you marinate in? Because we all marinated in something. And sometimes we get stuck in a problem, in a pattern, and keep doing the same bad behavior over and over, won't go see about it, don't know what to call it, because we marinated in it. That's called the pathology and the epigenetics, the things that she was talking about earlier. <laughs> that was a black moment right Dr. there. <laughs> Dr. Joy calls it one thing, yeah. From a spiritual perspective, I'm calling it um, cellular memory and pathology, the thing that causes dis-ease and disruption. So how do we get to forgiveness? Tell the truth about the, your crazy. That's right. Tell the truth about your crazy. I recognize my crazy. I gave it another name. And I work with her. Sometimes she show up and I'm just, girl, you need to go, so come, let me go sit my own self down. <laughs> I'm not even going to wait for nobody to come tell me to go somewhere. This is my crazy. 
But as long as you walking around acting like you ain't got a crazy, <laughs> that what you doing is perfectly normal when you know darn well it's not. As long as you're so busy looking at her crazy, his crazy, that you're crazy, and not telling the truth about you're crazy, you're never going to get over it. You're never going to be able to forgive. You got to know you're crazy. Know what triggers it. Know what calls it up. Know what you do when it's in it. Know what kind of hat it wear. My crazy wears a push-up bra. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Does that make sense? I can feel it coming. And I used to say, when you see crazy coming across the street, you be the one that need to cross and go to the doctor or to the somewhere. Okay? And until we really start identifying and telling the truth about our crazy, because it was a crazy that made you let him in. Don't look at him. Name your crazy. Give her a dress, take her to lunch, and you all will be fine. Then you can forgive yourself. You know, until you tell the truth about your crazy. And until you learn to, I call it triple A's. Triple A. Because when you're in breakdown, who you call? Triple A, right? Awareness, acknowledgement, acceptance. Become aware of your crazy. Acknowledge it for exactly what it is and what it inspires you to do. And then accept, okay, this is it. Don't go into denial. Because very often we go into denial about what we know to be true because we don't know what to do about it. And because we don't know what to do about it, we think if we ignore it, it'll go away. Like the queer people. We think if we ignore y'all, y'all will go away. But y'all are not going away, are you? <laughs> Good. Awareness, acknowledgement, acceptance without judgment. Understanding that the greatness created you knew you'd get to this moment when you'd have to tell the truth because the truth will set you free. And that truth is an acceptance and acknowledgement without judgment. So that you can then say, I can forgive this. I can forgive me. Because all things are lessons that God would have me learn. I missed that lesson. Again. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Don't make it as much about yes. forgiveness as about the process to understand how you got to where you got and how your crazy got you there, whether you inherited it, you picked it up, you made it up. And then take your crazy over to see the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Joy, I didn't know that we would have the um, privilege of you being with us the whole time. So I want to bring you back into the conversation and maybe shift it um, a little bit. And I want to talk about what real love looks like, what healthy love look, looks like. I know that um, many of us have not always seen that. We haven't had the opportunity. I often tell, talk about my parents. They'll be married 64 years in October, on October 15th. Nice. And I've never seen my parents have a fight. Uh, <laughs> my mother, when they worked, they retired now. My mother would come home, my father, every day, would get up out of the seat and give her a standing ovation and say, the star is born. They worked together. They raised us in that. I don't know, you know, I got my own reason why I got my way, but it wasn't because I saw it at home. <laughs> and so I wonder if we could talk about... Um, if you can share with us, when you saw real love in action, give us that image. They give us so many images of other, um, they give us images of hate in action. I'm so glad that you mentioned Beale Street. What a, what a magical, majestic um, experience and what black love looks like. It was my favorite book. I was afraid to <laughs> see it, but then he rocked it out. I should have known how Barry Jenkins is gonna do. But would you give us an idea about that? A time, something you, know, you saw? I, or There are so many. Uh, there are two that stood out for me. Um, and one actually is my granddaughter. She had to be about three years old. Now, her brother was just, he was, he, I don't even think he was walking. And uh, she, they were playing. I was watching them. I was kind of at the, at the, you know, the stove. And I'm watching them on the floor playing. 
And he reaches up and gets, she has lots of hair, grabs her hair. Now, he's a baby, and he pulls her head to the floor. Now his hands are tangled in her hair. She's screaming and crying. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. So I get over there. I'm untangling her hands. Uh, he's sitting there. He, he, don't, he don't know what's going on. She's crying because he, he literally was pulling her scalp out. And she runs over to him, hugs him, and kisses him and then runs into my arms and just cries. But I stopped and I thought, oh my God. I mean, who does that? You know what I mean? What little kid does that? And I saw this immediate demonstration that I love him even though he hurt me. He hurt me, but I love him. And now I'm going to bury my, my face in your chest and cry. But it was a moment for me where I look at, my God, look at what this child did. Second thing that happened for me, and I, and I want to, first of all, thank you all for being there. I just feel so, I wasn't going nowhere because I need the therapy myself, okay? <laughs> I need to be in the room with y'all, okay? Um, heal or help thyself, you know what I mean? Um, honestly. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful. And, and I want to I wanna reiterate something, and that is, you know, I to stay in the room. I love what the brothers were saying. I love what my sister Yellow was saying. Stay in the room. It gets hard, but don't leave. Don't leave the room. So the second situation that I saw, which really um, affected me, is I was I was shopping. I was in one, in one of them stores shopping around, and I kept hearing this really grotesque grunting, just really grotesque grunting. And um, as I turned, I actually, am, the aisle is blocked because there's a, a young woman um, in, a, in a wheelchair. I know they were from the Middle East. I could detect, um, I think it was Arabic. I'm not certain. Um, but the person in the chair uh, looked to be fully adult, but clearly um, had some major severe, uh, either brain injury or uh, def, you know something at birth. So she she couldn't speak. She could only scream and grunt. And I'm watching this mother and this father. Now, everyone around is moving, trying to avoid them, trying to look somewhere else. And I am so affected by the grace, the sweetness of the love that they showed to her. Never once did they seem impatient or concerned. The love was so clear, and it was their love that calmed her. Because, you see, she had no other way to communicate. So the father comes over and kisses her on the forehead and rubs her hand, and they continue to shop. But in that moment, something else happened in me. You know, my mother uh, used to always say to me as a little girl, I used to cry because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. And it was a moment of humbling, but there was also a moment that really showed a big grown-up love, a love that was not uh, that 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 escaped this world and that in that body and escapes our body, and that part, that spiritual peace, that connection. I felt grateful. I felt grateful for being a participant in that moment. So that I mean, there is love. Love is abundant. Love is, is, is a cause of our being. Love is what holds the atoms in the universe together. I think we have to understand that. The horrible things, the things that uh, I think it, that stain my soul. I had a young brother. Uh, I was teaching high school. And it's a young athlete, beautiful black, black young man, probably about 16, 17 years old. And I'm doing a class on life skills, because that's why they've called me in. They say, y'all can bounce the ball, but Dr. Joy is going to come in and going to teach you a little bit about, you know, life skills. And in other words, how to, how to become your whole self. And uh, we were talking about relationships. And he, he stood up and he looked at me. Now, this brother, let me give you a picture of him. I'm talking about smooth, just smooth black. Smooth, cold, black, gorgeous. I mean, this is a beautiful young black Wakanda brother. You see what I'm saying? And uh, he 
he says to me, he stands up and he says to me, my mama told me don't bring home nothing black as you. And it stunned me. It felt like somebody hit me in the chest. He said, my mama said, don't you ever bring home nothing black as you. And I, I was stunned. And when he saw me stunned, not understanding that it, it hurt my heart, he said, oh, but Miss Joy, I could probably bring you home. And I said to him, that's not a compliment to me. And I realized just how injured he was. But before I could even move on it, I could feel his mother, who was also the rich chocolate he was. And I could feel how many times she was picked over. I'm not, oh, she's too dark. And you see, she did not want the suffering she had experienced for her son. She knew nothing else to say but that. But you see, she was injured. She was injured. She was not properly loved, nor did she love herself. And so I'm in this moment with this young boy, and I don't want to injure him further. But I want to tell him how beautiful he is and that and how rich and wonderful he is. And I could feel his discomfort because it got a little too intimate in that moment. But what I understood in the horror was I was looking at the generational trauma. I'm not mad at her because I know what was done to her. I know what we did to her. And so what, what I think I see as that, that the catastrophe of our injury, the catastrophe of not feeling self-love is that our children, again, marinate in it. And he promptly went out and, and, and got pregnant someone uh, that if there was any other ethnicity in them, you couldn't see it. They were white. They're as white as white could be. That's what he immediately went out and did so that he could produce a child that did not look like him. So that to me was, was again, uh, one of those moments of horror. Thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Joyce. It's interesting to think about it. Maybe the mother wasn't trying to even protect her son, but maybe protect the granddaughter that he might one day have. Um, but I would like to continue um, to try to bring into some spaces the idea also of what a healthy love looks like. And from your own personal um, experience and life, when have you seen love show up in the most remarkable way or the way that guides you? Because there are so many injuries that guide us, but we're guided by some awfully beautiful things too. Last night, um, Dr. Sheila evans Trainum uh, was our brilliant keynote speaker, and the first thing she said is, look at me, I've lost 100 pounds. My wow. cholesterol was through the roof. I was, you know, uh, my heart. And Susan Taylor said, I'll walk with you. That's love. And she's 100 pounds lighter and looking good, younger than she did the day I met her 15 years ago. I'll walk with you. That's love. Tell me those images in your life. And we'll just go all the way down, starting with you, Dr. Byron. Sure. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So my sister's in the back. We're from New Orleans. And our mom passed away when I was 19. I think growing up, um, my mom was mom, dad, chef, philosopher, lawyer, dance instructor, teacher. You know, she was, she was all that. And to see my mom work so hard for us and sacrifice so much, in a context we lived in, for all intents and purposes, the hood. And my mom was probably the only college-educated woman in our entire community. But my mom just didn't take care of us. We, my mom was the only person who would take folks, you know, my friends, we, the, the only, our only conduit out of our, of our community to go to, you know, other parts of the city and go to art museums and go kind of explore. And so my mom, for me, was the embodiment of that. I remember asking my mom, you know, because you know, I know my dad loosely, and I asked her why he didn't pay child support. And she was like, you know, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to stress out and put energy into making someone try to do something they shouldn't. And I recognized that my mom was trying to, not trying to invite that toxicity into the space. 
so she protected me from that toxicity. I think about, in this context, I was very focused on the privileges I had. Even growing up in the hood myself, I got to go to private school a little bit um, and, and had a lot. You know, my, my mom was emotionally in a place where I think she could kind of provide a type of parenting that some of my friends and family didn't get. And this notion, you talked about it, this notion of using, I think love is using your power and privilege to help out other folks, right? And so my mom definitely embodied that. I think it's funny because you find folks who are also marginalized, when they're in a position of privilege, they sound just like the white folks they're angry at, you know, they're angry at when, they, when they're talking, you know, it's easy to see it when it's coming down, but when you're giving, dishing it out, and I think you see that often when, when you know, African Americans are talking about the queer community, or you have, you know, I sit in circles with very brilliant, you know, as a physician, my friends who, who are also physicians, we sit in circles and we, we like pontificate on all, this, all these things about blackness in corporate America, but then when we talk about under-resourced African Americans, we sound just like the white folks that we were just talking about. And so, and so I, I think, I think the times when I can see uh, our power and privilege be used for that. I think the notion of you guys doing this work that you're doing with mentorship, what what better pow power and privilege to use your experience in the love and the in the kind of knowledge that you've gained to give back to youth in that way, right? In in in, in a way where you're not every a ha you know you're not coming with this I have a hammer so everything's a nail approach. You're catering it to the youth that you're working with. You're respecting their culture. You're checking your own internal biases against this community, right? Because we said earlier, uh, skin folk ain't always kin folk. You know what I'm saying? And so the notion of checking in order to really give my privilege to, to out, outwardly, I also have to check my bias. I have to check my implicit bias. There's a great book I recommend everyone to read, particularly if you're working with kids. It's by uh, Claude Steele called Whistling Vivaldi. And this book is all about implicit bias and stereotype threat and how sometimes we internalize junk and give it out. And that junk also affects how we move in space. So when I'm going up against something where, where I have a stereotype, I may not perform as well. So you have to recognize all this if you're going to work with young people, right? You have to kind of mute them where they are. If you demonize their culture completely, how are you going to give love to them when, you, when you're working with them? And so I think the notion of using power and privilege for good is the definition of love, right? Uh, the, you know, the Bible talks about how God is love um, and to know if love is to know, to know God. And so I think the notion, if you're going to be a spiritual person, if you're not coming at me with love, then I, I, don't, I, can't, I, I can't see the God in, in what you're giving me, right? And so I think that's an important thing. And I think it's hard, and I really want to push on this. I've, I've listened to, you know, the two answers. I think it's hard to do that, too, because it's really hard for us to say what love looks like. So I want to push you a little bit, Dr. Byron. You said your mom very quickly moved right through it and then moved away. That's happened. Doc, Dr. Joy told a beautiful story about her graduate. We could see that. And then the hard story. It is hard for us to actually say, in this moment, I felt loved. I saw this. This was incredible. And we don't do it a lot. And that's why I'm going to push you on that. I'm going to ask but you. you let me ahead. just say, I think that there's a distinction we have to make between love and experiences masquerading as love. Right. And some of <laughs> yes. us get stuck in that masquerade. Yes. And then we get confused because we all do have that experience of what love is that you're talking about. And I want us to hear it. I want us to name it. I want us to be reminded of it. I'm reminded every day, everywhere, about we're almost, but that we could be dead, that our children don't matter, that this, and the things that keep me strong are those actions and those reminders of what someone did to save a life through love. Do you know what I mean? Like, go ahead. Let me try. I, I'm going to invite into the room Mr. Shaw, who is my fifth grade teacher. Uh, so I'm a black boy from Inglewood, California. Uh, uh -oh. I have mostly white teachers, again, given the fact that 98% of the workforce doesn't look like anybody in this room, definitely not me. Um, and often would ask questions. When the teachers were being nice, they called me loquacious. What they usually meant is that I talked too much and they didn't like the questions that I asked. And I would ask the same questions just to try and figure out the world and my place in it, and most teachers would dismiss it. They're not important, we'll get to it at some point in time, but otherwise signal to me that that which was most important to me did not matter. Mr. Shaw was the first person to see me and to let me know that I was validated in having all of the questions that I had. So love looked like him. Yeah calling my mother and saying to her, can I sit with him? Would it be okay if I take the time to help him figure out the questions that he has that I don't have answers to? And, and, and what he did was to sit with me and allow me to ask all of my questions and he didn't get defensive or feel like he had to have all of the answers. And the thing that he taught me to say was, I don't know, but we can figure it out together. I try and carry that with me 
and the work that I do with teachers. And the one question that I want all of them to ask every baby who they are entrusted to care, to be clear, educators do God's work. It is that's not right. for all people. And that's why I'm clear. If, it is hard work, but it is what is required. And if you are unwilling to do the work, then move. Right. The question for me that love is bound up in is do you believe that that child is a genius and capable of thriving, feeling safe, feeling engaged, being supported in whatever they dream? If you don't believe that's true, allow somebody to hold that dream until you can hold it for them too. And so for me, what it looks like is being disruptive. It looked like Michelle LeVon Robinson Obama standing in the White House with 200 black girls two Black History Months ago and telling them, run all up and through this house with your bare feet and your leotards on because this house is yours. <laughs> being disruptive, reminding people that in spite of the lies they tell, right? This is why this brother goes back to it. I'm, a, I'm an unapologetic member of the Mama's Boys Club too. Most of us know that if it were not for black women, we'd be in a far worse condition than we are now. <laughs> That's why, we, that's why we go there, but that's also why I appreciate the masquerading as trauma because my mama got a whole lot of trauma in spite of being brilliant, being the first advocate that I've ever known. But for me, so, so much of love, especially with our babies, is showing up with them in love, being willing to tell the truth. So many of us as adults lie and act like we never got a bad grade, like we all <laughs> went straight to college and went through in four years, never had a bad relationship, never made any of the decisions that make young people feel like they are the first person to ever go through the challenges associated with the, th this thing called life. So seeing people, validating them, believing in them, and then supporting them, especially when it gets difficult. That's the last piece. A lot of us do this when it's convenient and comfortable. It's easy to mentor a child that affirms all of the things that you know to be true and love in the world. The question is, are you willing to love them when it's uncomfortable? Unconditional. When you have to, very much so, when it's not about you. Right. Or, or actually when it is about you because it forces you to deal with your shit. The best babies do that to you. The, deal with your crazy. You right. Cra I'm sorry, Mama Susan. Deal with your crazy. But the, the best babies are the ones that do that. They say the water that I'm swimming in is toxic. The prob I've never met a problem child. The problem they often will tell you is you. Are you willing to listen in love? And, and you know, Mama Yana, um, I wonder if you could answer that. And I, um, I can. I'm, I got yeah, my answer. I, yeah, I, you got <laughs> I was 16 years old in Brooklyn, New York. Where? Um, uh, in, in total dysfunction, um, just everywhere in my life. And they took me to um, <coughs> Brookdale Medical Center to have my son in 1970. And I was so full of shame because back then you, you didn't get a TV show if you were 16 and pregnant. <laughs> and, you know, you, 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 some neighbors, some relatives' house you didn't go to because they were going to talk about you and your mama really hadn't told them. I didn't even have a mama and I was 16 and pregnant. And I went through those. Uh, my water broke on uh, Sunday and my son was born on Tuesday. So from Sunday Ooh. to Tuesday, I was in labor because there was nobody to come and sign for me to have a cesarean section. So I just, I just had to do that until they finally got the social worker to come in and do it. And they were, I was on the gurney on my way to have a C-section instead of a vaginal birth. And my son was born on the elevator. Oh, wow. Hospital. <laughs> And um, because we were on the elevator and we didn't have, like, the things we were supposed to have, he passed into life, and they took him and they laid him on my chest. And he didn't care that I was 16. <laughs> and he didn't know that his father had only spoken to me once. He didn't know that I walked through that pregnancy you know, just feeling wretched, that he marinated in my room. He didn't know. They laid him on my chest, and he wiggled his little head, and I know now he couldn't see, but our eyes locked, and I said, oh, my God. 
he loves me. And anybody who knows me knows, Susan can tell you, to this day, my son is my best friend. That was number one. Number two, I was in Brooklyn. <laughs> A student at Mega Evers College. Total devotee of Essence Magazine because I had never seen anything that told me how to be black and beautiful as a woman, other than Essence Magazine. And I think it was $1.75 or it was something. I didn't have no subscription back then. <laughs> there were like five of us who would get it and pass it around. <laughs> <laughs> and so, 19, it was 87 when the article came out. They wrote an art. There was an article in there about black women on welfare. I don't even remember who wrote the article, what the article was. I don't even remember. But I read that article and I said, wait a minute, hold up. Let me, there's a piece they're missing here. So I got my um, little paper and pencil and I wrote Essence magazine because they was missing a piece on the welfare mothers. I put that letter in an envelope addressed to Miss Susan Taylor. I sure did. And it must have been about two weeks later, I got a call from Susan Taylor's office. This was pre-cell phone caller ID. You just, either you answered the phone or you didn't. I think this was even pre-answering machine. So when you pick up the phone and somebody says they're calling you from Susan Taylor's office, you say you lie. <laughs> anyway, Susan Taylor had gotten my letter and was on the telephone and thought they needed to do an article about me. Susan freaking Taylor. <laughs> Anywho, so I uh, borrowed some clothes from my girlfriend and some jewelry from another one because I'm going to meet Susan Taylor at the Essence office at 1500 Broadway in Manhattan. Okay. And when I walked in the office, you know, after sitting outside, I walked in the office and she was standing behind her desk and here she said to me, you come over here and kiss me. <laughs> that was love. Susan freaking Taylor <laughs> <laughs> told me to come over here and kiss her or hug her. I don't know what she said. She could have been speaking French. I really don't know. <laughs> love. So for me, love is in that in the moment, authentic experience that validates the value of who you are without you having to do anything. Yes. That's right. Amen. Like my son did like Susan Taylor did. I want, you know, it's kind of like a, a Susan's story that I have too. So that's, yes, yes, that was so beautiful. And let me, let me turn to you um, and see if there's any questions out here that any of you would like to ask and turn to our digital masters sitting here quietly in the corner, Cicely Gay and Eric Jones, and see if there's anything on through our Facebook stream. And thank you for keeping it all alive and doing things I, you know, I can't even pronounce, <laughs> um, and bring them into the conversation. And, and oh, wait, wait a minute. Susan Taylor wants to get in. She's asking me. Susan freaking Taylor's here. <laughs> Susan freaking Taylor. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. We're gonna. We. Do we have the cameras over? Wait for this microphone. <laughs> because oh should I go this can the camera see me great okay because I have to go downstairs and put on get a do a little taping we're doing community wellness circles for our people all throughout the nation and I'm doing a little message for them but I wanted to share a story about a man loving a woman a story of love and it showed me how much Kefra loved me and if Kefra was here I would tell the story differently 
But when people think you're Susan freaking Taylor, you know, <laughs> they think that you should be married to or be dating an ambassador or somebody who's fancy and whatever, you know? And we all have our stories of abuse and whatnot. But as you said, they're all lessons in living, right? So Kevra and I are dating, and I'm supposed to be speaking in Detroit to the Deltas. My sister calls and says, my God, mommy's having a stroke. What? You gotta come. I call Kefra, who lived around the corner. This is my granddaughter, Amina, who lived around the corner from my mother. And I ran to my mother's house up in Harlem, Brownstone. Kefra came. We're there. And I said, oh my God, I gotta cancel. There's no way I'm going to Detroit. Let them know. He says, no, you go. I have your back. It is so rare that we hear that from anybody as black women. But to hear it from a brother who is dating me, he says, I have your back. I'm gonna take care of Babs. I always call my mother Babs, not to her face all the time. <laughs> You're gonna take care of Babs? He said, get on the plane and go. I'm gonna take care of Babs. I get on the plane, I get to Detroit, and I meet women today who were there, the Deltas who were there. I don't know what I said that day, but I prattled on through the story, got back on the plane, came home. My sister said, mommy is at doctor's hospital. I got to doctor's hospital, and my mother was sitting up in bed laughing. That little skinny man, he picked me up, and he carried me into the hospital. <laughs> Marry him, mommy, please. Don't go. <laughs> Marry that man. He's a good man. He's a good man. When I couldn't take my mother shopping, Kefra said, don't worry, I'll take mommy shopping. Because my mother had like a little mean mouth. She loved Kefra. I'll take, I'll, I'll take your mother shopping. He would take my mother shopping. A flood in the brownstone. The lady upstairs who paid $29 a month, right? My mother couldn't stand Miss Lynch, another Trinidadian. Look at that in a mink coat. But of course she's a mink coat. She don't pay no rent. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Miss, Miss, Miss Lynch let the faucet run over and all the water comes running down the four stories of the brownstone, floods my mother's area. She calls Kefra. He came, he mop up everything and went and helped Miss Lynch. This is a good man. I guess I tell that story to say, we have to look beyond the accoutrement. Right. There are a whole lot of good men out here who may not That's have a big right. paycheck, who may be shorter than you, bald, fat, whatever. <laughs> you know, the, the gifts are on the inside. And that's really where I began to look. The gifts are on the inside. And you know, and that's the only place where we grow and get better and better. So I just say, that's, that's my Kefi. You know, I love my baby. <laughs> that's my story of love. You know, living love, not just talking about it. Kefi always says love is a verb. That's living love. He lived it. We've been married now. This is our 30th year. It's the only thing my mother ever told me to do that I listened to. <laughs> I love you so much. Let me, hear your, let me hear your stories of love. Bring it into the room. We don't get to see it enough. We don't talk about it enough. We don't say, this happened to me on this day, and it made me whole. It made me a better person. So I'm going to come over here and get a couple. OK. Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to say your name. And yeah. So my name is Tracy Knight, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. So I guess what I wanted to say is so often when we have loving relationships, or maybe we've had relationships that have been somewhat traumatic, our natural inclination is to withdraw and to withhold and to never love again. So I've been married twice and I've been divorced twice. <clears throat> and I was saying to my mother and my sister just the other day, I said, every relationship I've had has been a tremendous success. And it's a running joke that I have good friendships with both of my ex-husbands and all the men that I've ever dated. And it's because I see relationships as a platform for mirroring back who I am and where I need to grow and what I need to do next. And so they show up to teach me. And so they've been my greatest teacher and my greatest students. And so the last piece is that I, <clears throat> I was saying to my younger sister who wants to still be married and wants to have children, and she's so terrified because I've been divorced, my mother's been divorced, my great-grandmother's been divorced. I think I said my grandmother, my great-grandmother. So she's like, we must be cursed. I said, it's not a curse. And so she's done nothing. She's too afraid to date. She's too afraid to just put herself out there. And so what she has is a void of love in her life. Yeah. You know, and I feel like I've been courageous and I continue to be courageous to love because I continue to be courageous enough to look at myself and to open myself up to just growing. So. 
Thank you, Tracy. And, and, uh, thank you, Tracy. And, uh, let me ask, and I know I have Dr. Oates over here, and then I want to get see if there's anybody here before we come back to the panel. But I'm going to ask the question specifically again, <laughs> because it's hard for us to do this. Tell me your love story. Tell me a moment you felt loved. Right? Did you, we you know what I'm saying? You. Who's your kefra mopping up the flood? Right? Who, who put their head on your shoulder and made you feel whole when nobody on the planet did? Now, I ask you that because we don't see it. We don't see it. So think about that as I come over here. I know I saw your hand up, Dr. Oates. Okay, um, my name is Dr. Faya. I am in Atlanta and working with the university for parents. So I'm working with the parents of the youth. So it is um, an honor to be here. So I kind of want to, um, I don't like to say piggyback, lying back on what Ayanla said about forgiveness because we have to add the spiritual component. You have to. And traditional psychology doesn't. They deal with acceptance, and our brain is built to hold on to things. Our brain defaults to revenge. So these are things that our brain has been built for, so we have to go deeper than that. So one of my favorite quotes is, once we realize we have no enemies, only guides to our spiritual growth. Everyone in your life is a mirror to your forgotten self. Okay, your forgotten self is your subconscious thinking. Anytime somebody does something as you can uh, perceive to you, they're actually helping you to identify the story you're telling yourself because you will always create a reality to match that story. So they're doing you a favor. And if we could look at people doing us a favor and then we could actually move into gratitude, into thanking them for doing that for us. There's nothing to hold on to anymore. We're now letting it go, we're releasing, so now we're going into a deeper level. And then I love again, the scripture you brought up. We also have to look at our lives as purposeful, that it's an unfolding of this divine plan in us. So that instead of saying this shouldn't have happened, say, no, it happened the way it was supposed to happen, so what is in it for me? So you go from being problem, um, focusing on the problem to focusing on the solution. So I just wanted to bring that. Thank you so much. And you know, again, I'm, I'm gonna come over to you, Andre, and I just wanna say it. Um, I think that all the wisdom we share, if we cannot see it, we will not put it 